With me on the pod is Natasha Bertrand. She's a staff writer at The Atlantic covering national security and politics and a contributor to NBC News and MSNBC and a big time friend of the pod. Thank you for doing it. How you doing? Thanks for having me, Tommy. I'm good. Um, I feel like it's been a while since we talked. There's been like 400 indictments, uh, a lot of churn, a lot of turnover, but um, you know, it's good to, good to hear your voice again. So I wanted to start with uh, my friend, Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General. It's been a hell of a few days for him because first it was reported that he uh, talked about invoking the 25th Amendment to remove President Trump from office and even discussed wearing a wire to record their conversation to build his case, which is really weird. And then on Monday, according to this on Tuesday, there were reports that he was going to resign. Uh, he was sort of forced to run over to the White House, grovel. Uh, and then I guess there's a stay of execution until Thursday. So maybe we could start with the first piece of this, which is the New York Times story about the 25th Amendment and uh, the idea that he was looking to record Trump's comments. What do you make of that report and, and maybe the motives behind however it got out? Yeah, I think that you're asking a question that not enough people have asked, which is what would have been Rosenstein's reasoning for wanting to record the president? Um, we've heard, of course, that he was perhaps being sarcastic, but I would not be entirely surprised if he was being serious because, of course, this was a really sensitive moment, a really chaotic moment in the Trump administration. Um, he had just fired Comey. He had just met with the Russians in the Oval Office and disclosed classified information that the Israelis had given us. So there was a whole lot of there were a whole lot of things happening at the time that made it seem like Trump really was not fit to hold the office. Um, and so you have to look at this suggestion that Rosenstein made through that lens. Um, he it, this wasn't just the aftermath of, of the Comey firing. Um, this was also when Trump was interviewing people to be the FBI director. And according to the report that we saw, Rosenstein actually wanted to wear this wire while he sat in on Trump's interviews with a prospective FBI director. He wanted people who were perhaps interviewing for the job to wear these wires. And that suggests to me that Rosenstein was worried that perhaps Trump was going to ask for some kind of loyalty oath um, from from the FBI directors that he was interviewing. Um, I really can't see any other reason um, why he specifically would want uh, to people to be recording Trump while he questioned um, the, the, the person that was ostensibly going to be leading the investigation into his campaign team. It just seems to me like he had known that Trump had made these requests to Comey, that he had fired him with corrupt intent. And now he wanted to prove to the world, perhaps, whether or not these were going to these recordings were going to be released publicly. Of course, we'll never know and nothing ever came of it. But I think that he wanted to prove and be vindicated by the idea that, no, Trump did not fire Comey because he was angry over how he handled the Hillary Clinton email uh, debacle. He was he fired Comey because of the Russia investigation. See, this is why I like talking to you, because you remind me of the substance and don't let me jump to the politics of it first. <laughs> because like you're, you're right. Like you should put your mind in his head and think, what? Well, why would you want to do this? I mean, we know from Omarosa that D.C. is a, a one party consent town, so you can record someone and it's not illegal. But if you recorded, let's say, a, an FBI director's conversation with the president and you're at DOJ, are there legal issues there? Because there has to be. You know, it's a really good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. I would say the, the people that I've spoken to have said that Rosen, people who know Rosenstein have worked with him have said that he would never actually do this. Um, then again, it was a really chaotic moment and it was unprecedented. And so, you know, there was a feeling that anything could go at that at that time. But as far as whether or not it would be ethical for him to do this, that is another question entirely. Now, he could perhaps argue that he was saving the republic and that anything was warranted. Um, but legally, I, I, I don't know um, whether that would be a gray area. Yeah. So uh, you wrote a great piece about uh, what Rod Rosenstein's departure would mean for the Mueller investigation. Can you walk us through the implications of him resigning or Trump firing Rosenstein? Yeah. So as of right now, if if he does meet with Trump on Thursday and Trump kind of rails on him and, and ultimately decides that he's out, um, then Noel Francisco, the, the current um, number four at the Justice Department, that we currently have a number three as the acting, um, so it would kind of fall to him, uh, he would take over the Russia investigation. And that is 
concerning to some people because he has expressed skepticism of special counsels in the past. He has a pretty expansive view on executive privilege, which could allow Trump to shield certain evidence or communications from prosecutors. Um, he has remained relatively moot and, you know, throughout the last year and a half on the Mueller investigation has said virtually nothing about it. So it's really hard to tell whether his his views that he's, you know, iterated in the past would extend um, to his new new position. Um, but that is that is definitely a concern that I've heard among among, uh, you know, legal experts. Now, the other question, though, is whether or not he would have a conflict of interest because his firm, Jones Day, was, of course, um, a lawyer for the Trump transition. Uh, Trump campaign. So he would potentially have to either get a waiver from the White House to serve um, as the overseer of the Russia investigation, or he might just pass it off as kind of a, a hot potato because he doesn't necessarily want this job. It's a very stressful job, but you're subjected to attacks repeatedly by the president. Um, so that is still up in the air. But what we know is that the White House and the Justice Department have agreed that for now, as soon as Rosenstein is gone, then Noel Francisco would immediately, if not forever, um, take on that role. Um, but that does not, you know, guarantee whether or not Rosenstein is replaced. That does not guarantee that the Mueller investigation is going to be shut down. Um, like I said, it's really hard to predict what Francisco or any other replacements actions would be with regard to the Mueller investigation and, and having someone highly sympathetic, um, perhaps to, to Trump in that position is not, is not a guarantee. Um, so I think that when this news broke that Rosenstein was perhaps leaving, everyone needed to kind of take a deep breath because it did not necessarily mean the end of the Mueller investigation. Taking a more pessimistic view, I think you could say that, you know, any Anyone who does replace Rosenstein, who has been a very staunch defender of Mueller and who has really taken on um, kind of a hands off approach to the entire investigation and let Mueller do his thing. Um, anyone who replaces him could potentially be a little more hands on and could try to stymie the investigation in a way, in subtle ways that Rosenstein maybe didn't. So it's really it's it's unclear at this moment. So just stepping back a little bit, I mean, we know of Rod Rosenstein as the, the person overseeing uh, the Mueller investigation who named the special counsel. But. The deputy attorney general is a is a big job. You run the day to day operations of the Department of Justice. Um, do you get a sense of how disruptive his firing would be to the work they're doing to the department, to law enforcement, to the FISA efforts, to I guess the FBI as well? Yeah, it would be a major upheaval, and people at the Justice Department are really they don't want this. They want him to stay in his job. He's a very steadying hand. Um, and of course, the White House would have to go through the motions. If, if Noel Francisco did not accept this position, they would have to find um, a new uh, person to oversee the Russia investigation. It's also uh, not clear whether they're going to divide up the acting attorney general. They're going to make an, a, an attorney general versus a deputy attorney general versus acting deputy attorney general, um, which would go to uh, Jeff Sessions, chief of staff currently. So they would make it even more complicated. So, so weird. It's 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 very, very strange. And we don't know what's going to happen. It's unprecedented. But there is definitely a sense that no one in the Justice Department wants this. Um, they drafted an exit statement. Um, as we saw yesterday, it was reported that, you know, conveyed the department's feelings about Rosenstein, which is that he's, he's you know, a, he's very respected. He's a career official. He'll be missed, et cetera. Um, but I think that even if we see Rosenstein leave, Congress is going to really tighten the noose um, on him and on the Justice Department. Um, I think Mark Meadows already said that even if Rosenstein is out, he still needs to testify before Congress about the report that he wanted to wire the president and, you know, invoke the 25th Amendment. Um, and of course, after the New York Times story broke, we already saw kind of Republicans leaping uh, on the idea of subpoenaing the, the memos that, you know, uh, allegedly disclosed all of this, all of these uh, things that Rosenstein said during those meetings. So, so Republicans, I think, are kind of sad salivating either way. Um, I don't think it's going to affect them one way or the other in terms of going after the Russia investigation. But as far as as far as Rosenstein leaving, it's not something that anyone is greatly um, eager for. Speaking of memos, on September 17th, President Trump ordered law enforcement and intelligence officials to declassify documents related to the Russia investigations, including text messages from some of the officials, some summaries of interviews that were conducted, and, and documents related to the surveillance of Carter Page. And then a few days later, 
Trump reverse himself and said, no, we actually won't declassify and release those documents. Let's have a DOJ review them instead. Do you understand what happened in those intervening days that led to that walk back? No, and that's a really good question. I think that what, based on my conversations with people involved in this entire process, what seems to have happened is that Trump was told that releasing all of this material would not necessarily be good for him. Um, This is obviously sensitive material related to the Russia investigation. And Republicans have tried, Republicans who are attacking the Russia investigation have tried to make it seem like all of these text messages and the Carter Page documents, et cetera, are really, really incriminating for the Justice Department and for prosecutors and for the FBI that's been investigating all this since 2016. Um, But taking a closer look, and again, based on my conversation, conversations with the people involved in this process you don't the republicans don't want to die on the carter page hill right yeah. i mean carter page there's a mountain of evidence to suggest that Carter Page has had ties to Russian intelligence since at least 2013, well before any of this came out into the open, well before, you know, obviously Trump was running for president. So this is releasing more information about the surveillance activity on Carter Page and the justification um, that the FBI used when applying for a warrant um, to surveil him would reveal more information about his ties to Russia and raise more questions about why the president chose him to be on his campaign. Yeah, and we also know that Carter Page lied or or at least changed his stories a number of times about trips to Russia, meetings with Russian officials. I mean, I guess I'm I'm confused about why people like Devin Nunez and other allies of Trump on the Hill have been pushing so hard for these documents. Are they is they just desperate for anything they can use to show allegations of bias are true? Yeah. So what I've been told is that they think that the Carter Page FISA warrant in particular is a way to prove that the Steele dossier was used as kind of uh, was used in FBI investigative materials. And that in turn, they say, can discredit the entire origin of the Russia investigation. So if they can prove, for example, that the FBI used the Steele dossier to justify aspects of, of its surveillance on Carter Page, then perhaps that will allow them to prove that the FBI relied on the Steele dossier to launch the entire investigation. Now, of course, we know that that's not true. The investigation was launched because of George Papadopoulos's big mouth um, at a bar in London um, when he was told about these stolen emails that the Russians had. Um, But it's still kind of the Hail Mary, which is that they saw that snippets of information from the dossier made its way into the FISA warrant, and it did. with the caveat, of course, that they added that Chris Steele is a reliable source and has been for the FBI for a number of years. But, you know, all that aside, this is a way they feel that they can discredit the entire investigation from its very beginning. Yeah. Let's talk Russia. Um, There have been two very expansive pieces in the last week or two about how Russia tried to subvert our elections. One was in The New York Times. They did, you know, sort of 12 pages of reporting on it. There's another in The New Yorker. Is there anything that you found particularly interesting or notable about what we're still learning about the different ways Russia is using cyber tools to influence our elections? Yeah. So that piece in The New Yorker was, I think, the piece that everyone has been waiting for. It it proved how people saying that Russia did not change votes in the election and that Russia really had no influence on anyone in the election. Um, You know, some people said, well, Russia didn't hold a gun to my head when I was in the voting booth Um, is is complete nonsense. Um, Trump won the Electoral College by something like 80,000 votes across three states. Um, And if only a small percentage of the people that voted for him were influenced in some way by Russian propaganda on social media, then that made a dramatic impact um, on the outcome of the election. And so I think that diving into the impact that Russia, Russian propaganda and influence operations on Twitter and Facebook and YouTube and Google and, you know, you and, you know, everything else, Instagram, I think is a way to answer this question when, you know, Republicans or Trump allies ask it of, well, 
how do you know that Russia influenced the election? There's no there's no way to prove that Russia influenced the election. Sure, they interfered, but but how do you know they they influenced it? Well, just look at the small small number of votes that Trump won by Trump won by, and just take a glance at the things that people in your Facebook feed are sharing. I mean, the, these are articles and you know posts that were shared hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times. And the idea that not one of them influenced a single person is just completely preposterous. So, so that New York article is definitely one that everyone should read. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's still happening, right? I mean, there's a bunch of campaigns this year that have already been targets of, of hacking campaigns, including a Democrat who unsuccessfully ran uh, for the nomination to challenge Dana Rohrbacher, who's Russia's man in Washington. Um, the DNC has pledged not to use any stolen or hacked materials for campaigns, but it, it seems like Republicans are refusing to match that commitment. Are, are you are, is there any chance that the parties come together and say, hey, let's not let foreign propaganda be used against us? Yeah. So it's actually um something I've done a lot of reporting on, which is it's actually the DCCC um, that has pledged not to use any hacked material in their um, real, in their election campaigns, and the NRCC, which has not. Right. <laughs> part of the part of the DNC, actually, I've been trying to get a hold of, and they will not answer my emails, so answer my emails. But you hear that, the, DNC? At the, <laughs> right, Natasha, back. At the heart of this, at the heart of this is really um, the reluctance of the Republicans to say that if a hack document is leaked to the media, for example, and the media already is reporting on it and it's already out in the public sphere, will Republicans then exploit that? Will they use that in ads? Will they essentially use the hack document without using the hack document, if you know what I mean? So Democrats have said that they won't do it, that even if something that has been hacked has made its way into the public sphere, that they're still not going to use it in ads. They're not going to run on it. They're not going to invoke it in any way. Republicans don't want to make that commitment. They say that as long as it's in the public sphere, then it's fair game. Um, as of right now, they have not reached a consensus on this issue. Part of the what, what Republicans wanted to do is they wanted to shift the onus onto the reporters and the media and say and include kind of a bullet point in this pledge that they made that – uh, criticizes the media while not themselves committing to not using any of this hack material in any in any kind of their campaign materials. Um, so they kind of want to have it both ways in that in that sense. They they'd be willing to sign on to this pledge not to uh, exploit these hack documents as long as it doesn't make them you know commit to not using them as long as they're in the public sphere and Democrats are are kind of moving along on their own. Um, the senatorial counterparts of each of these committees are still in question so stay tuned <laughs> yeah i mean i guess there's a giant loop here loophole here for everyone which is super PACs independent expenditure arms like all the gross dark money that gets cranked into elections uh, yeah. late in the game anyway definitely um when we talked at the beginning of the year you had just published a piece in the atlantic that included transcripts of messages between roger stone and wikileaks from october 2016 um i guess he had apparently exchanged dms on twitter with gustifer 2.02 a a uh, who is a front for the Russians? We now know. C can you talk us through like what you had reported earlier in the year and the questions that reporting left you about how WikiLeaks operates and, and asserts its influence? Definitely. So prior to my reporting, we had not known that Roger Stone was communicating directly with WikiLeaks Twitter account, which is run by Julian Assange, um, during the 2016 election. Obviously, he had said many times during the election, teased many things about big drops that were coming, um, an October surprise. Um, he seemed to have previous knowledge of, of things that WikiLeaks was going to drop. Um, so that raised a lot of questions. But what I reported was that he actually reached out to WikiLeaks in October, and he asked them to stop railing on him. Essentially, what was happening was that WikiLeaks was trying to distance itself from Roger Stone to preserve some shred of credibility. And Roger Stone had reached out and said, hey, man, I'm the only one defending you guys right now, because, of course, this was after WikiLeaks had already published all of the hacked DNC documents in the summer. And so Roger Stone was saying, I'm really your only friend. You need to learn who your friends are. Stop attacking me. Stop trying to distance yourself from me. And WikiLeaks wrote back and said, well, you know, you are undermining us and you're making it seem like this is all one big coordinated effort between the Trump campaign and uh, WikiLeaks. 
Now, this entire conversation sounded very contrived and it did not seem like, you know, there there's there seems to be a general there seems to have been a general awareness that they were talking on Twitter DM. And I am not I have not confirmed that that was either the beginning or the end of their correspondence. Um, but there is one clue, which is that after the election, WikiLeaks reached out to Roger Stone again and said, are you happy now? We're free. We're now more free to talk. Um, and that was on November 9th. So. Questions are still swirling about whether Roger Stone did, in fact, meet in person with Assange. Of course, I think it was the Wall Street Journal that reported that they had dinner together or that Roger Stone had intimated that they had dinner together. Um, Whether there was some kind of intermediary that was feeding Roger Stone information about Assange and WikiLeaks. But what we do know is that... Robert Mueller is very, very interested in Roger Stone, and speculation is also swirling that he could be the next person to be indicted. And it's not just anyone speculating about that. It's Roger Stone himself. Roger Stone has said that he expects to be indicted by Mueller. So once once he is or isn't or is interviewed by Mueller, which he hasn't been, which is also a major clue that he's at the center of this investigation, um, we will kind of tie up the loose ends that there still are about whether or not there was any coordination between the campaign and WikiLeaks and therefore, by extension, the campaign and Russia. Um, so big open question, but but nothing is going to happen until after the midterms, obviously. It's so funny to think that these guys would be dumb enough to communicate via Twitter DM. I mean, any like person worth the, their salt in terms of protecting sources would be on Signal or encrypted email or some other encrypted messaging app. I mean, I, maybe they, this is just the way they made first contact, but it seems crazy to me. Right. And we also saw Donald Trump Jr. communicating with, with WikiLeaks. <laughs> yeah. So my, well, he's a moron. You know, so what, on yeah. Twitter DM. <laughs> um, one so of the they were you, not really concerned with OPSEC. No, you're right. You're right. I didn't, no one thought they'd win. Uh, you also reported about how there was this far right blogger named Charles Johnson, who was also a Holocaust denier. Um, who may have played a role in how WikiLeaks eventually got to Donald Trump Jr. It's this bizarre chain of events that includes some of the truly worst people in conservative politics, like Dana Rohrabacher, who we talked about earlier, who's a big fan of the Russians. Um, How is it that Charles Johnson and Dana Rohrabacher become the conduit to WikiLeaks for Donald Trump Jr., of all people? Wow, you are going way back in my reporting. <laughs> All your <history>. good stuff. <laughs> um, so basically, it's a complicated web. But Charles Johnson, who he calls himself an independent journalist, he is a far right extremist figure. Um, he runs this website called Got News. And on September twentieth, so such a lame name for a website. <laughs> that is so. Hey, I what's know, a stupid like milk ad from unoriginal. the mid two thousand? Let's make that our website. But anyway, sorry, go on, continue. <laughs> So he published an article on September 20th, 2016, um, claiming that he had obtained a memo from a George Soro, and I'm quoting, George Soro tied PR firm that is launching a website to spread conspiracy theories about Trump's connections to Russia. And he said that that site, PutinTrump.org, was going to be launched on September 21st. He updated his article again to include the password for PutinTrump.org, which was still locked at that time. And he said that he had obtained it from Got News researchers. So there's that. Two hours after he published that article on Got News about this conspiracy website, WikiLeaks shared the PutinTrump.org site and its password in a tweet, which Johnson then took credit for. (laughs) Then 10 minutes later, (laughs) WikiLeaks repeated those quote unquote discoveries in a private message to Trump Jr. Um, And that was the first instance in which WikiLeaks, according to these DMs that we saw, reached out to Trump Jr. was to alert him to this kind of conspiratorial thing that Chuck Johnson said he had discovered about a website funded by George Soros that was going to dedicate itself exclusively to looking into Trump's Russia ties. Um, So (laughs) WikiLeaks reached out to Trump Jr., said that a a PAC is running this anti-Trump site that you should be aware of. And Trump Jr. said, off the record, I don't know who that is, but I'll ask around. And that was kind of the end of it. But what we see is this very clear, bizarre um, uh, trajectory from Chuck Johnson to WikiLeaks to Donald Trump Jr. And it was all very 2016. Yeah, very 2016. I mean, it, it's just so weird. Like when I was at the White House in the NSC, I remember getting that first tranche of WikiLeaks documents, all these leaked cables, 
uh, that were from Chelsea Manning. Um, and, and at that period of time, it did feel like there was a sincere uh, whistleblowing element to what they're doing, their mission. Um, but now we've got the Guardian reporting that Russian diplomats have been in secret talks with people close to Assange mm-hmm. uh, about trying to get him from the UK where he's been holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy for years. They, they didn't fall through with it, but it, it it adds to this growing body of evidence that WikiLeaks is a Russian carve out. And I guess I'm trying to wrap my mind around whether that was the case the whole time, whether this is a marriage of convenience because Julian Assange uh, has uh, you know, a warrant out for his arrest and can't get the hell out of an embassy in the UK. I mean, do you have any sense of how the intelligence community views WikiLeaks as you know, morphing over time? Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great question. I think that the transformation can be attributed to Julian Assange's desire for a safe haven. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been trying to get into Russia since at least 2010. That's when he first applied for a Russian visa. It didn't work out. But at first, you're right. His mission with WikiLeaks was to be a radical transparency organization, and he was kind of an equal opportunity offender in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, He has always had this idea that perhaps WikiLeaks was going to become this massive open source kind of parallel intelligence arm almost where whistleblowers could go and kind of create their own, you know, outcomes and reality with leaks. But ultimately what it became was Julian Assange being a a Putin stooge and Mm -hmm. being a a stooge for Russia. I think we saw that, of course, with, you know, he he did try to get into Russia from from the Ecuadorian embassy, as you mentioned, with the Guardian article that was ultimately aborted, um, according to people that I've spoken to, because they thought that they were going to there was they thought that there was a grab team outside of the Ecuadorian embassy that was going to snatch Julian Assange as he was trying to make his escape. So this wasn't necessarily an idea that was aborted because Julian had a change of heart. It's because he thought he was going to get caught. So if you put the timeline together and if you take everything that Julian Assange was doing during the 2016 election which was completely devoted his his interests were completely aligned with Russia's he was completely devoted to defeating Hillary Clinton a lot of the leaks that have come out um, from his you know former supporters during that period have shown that he was just he he thought Hillary Clinton was was literally the devil Um, and he was working with Russia by releasing all of the material that they gave him and if you put that together and if you see that by the end of 2017 he was trying to escape the Ecuadorian embassy with Russia's help it just seems very obvious that that was what he was banking for God imagine a world where Hillary Clinton isn't Secretary of State never pisses off Putin or Julian Assange and then runs for president without those two assholes gunning for her the whole time it's a very very different outcome (laughs) Um, my last question for you, because I've asked you about literally everything you've ever reported over the past year, but I read all your <laughs> stuff. Um, you wrote a piece today about how Orrin Hatch has quietly weighed in on this big upcoming Supreme Court case that could have huge implications for special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia investigations. Can you, can you lay out what that piece says and uh, why it's so important? Yeah, so I was, I was a bit shocked when I came across this amicus brief that Orrin Hatch filed earlier this month. He filed it on September 11th. And it's part of a case that on its face really has nothing to do with the Mueller investigation. It has to do with a man who's fighting um, a federal charge based on double jeopardy. He says that he was wrongfully charged by both the state and by the federal government for the same crime. And he says that that violates his his Fifth Amendment constitutional right um, to not be tried for the same thing twice. So Orrin Hatch has weighed in. And this obviously has big implications for the Mueller investigation, even if it's not directly related to it, because the kind of saving grace that many people have said could prevent Trump from issuing pardons kind of willy-nilly in the Russia investigation is that he will be deterred by the fact that many of these people who are caught up in the Russia probe could be charged anyway on the state level for the same crimes. Hmm. Um, And that's due to something um, that's referred to as the dual sovereignty dual sovereignty doctrine, which essentially says that, well, the federal government has the right to preserve and protect its own laws. So do states. 
So Orrin Hatch, Mr. Conservative Republican, who you would think would be on the side of states' rights here, Mm -hmm. he files this amicus brief saying that the dual sovereignty doctrine should be overturned, that it should be put to rest, and that the there should be no ability of states to charge people based on crimes that they have committed, that they've already been charged with at the federal level wow. um, and either been acquitted, acquitted for or pardoned. Um, so essentially this would open the door to if the case went through and if, if the dual sovereignty um, doctrine was overturned. This would, of course, open the door for Trump to be free to issue pardons without the fear of having them blow up in his face by having you know his children, for example, Mm -hmm. or his associates who have been caught up in the Mueller investigation be charged with state crimes. Um, So something he did quietly, Orrin Hatch did quietly, it was a 44-page amicus brief, very, very detailed, very firm in his belief that this should be overturned. And of course, experts I spoke to said this is crazy, especially coming from Orrin Hatch, because it would essentially upend the entire idea of federalism. and it would take away states' rights to uh, prosecute um, crimes that they're, you know, state state law enforcement. It would compromise state law enforcement and allow the dramatic expansion of Trump's pardon power and his ability to interfere um, in in states' God. law enforcement procedures. So very surprising, um, or perhaps not, <laughs> because yeah. Orrin Hatch is, of course, a, a staunch Trump ally. But we'll have to see how this case plays out because it is a 150-year precedent, the dual sovereignty doctrine. And throwing it out would be – it would certainly muddy the waters, as, as one legal expert told me. My God, yeah. I mean, that feels like a huge deal. And, and to your point, I mean, Hatch is retiring. He's on his way out, and I guess rightly mm-hmm. so. But he's been, he's been someone that is uh, – out ahead of almost everyone else on pushing for Kavanaugh's nomination. His staff has Mm -hmm. clearly been coordinating uh, all kinds of uh, rebuttals and attacks on people who have accused Kavanaugh uh, of of sexual misconduct. I mean, it is really pretty shocking the degree to which he is he is carrying water for President Trump at this point. And of course, Kavanaugh will likely I mean, we have to wait and see what happens this week. But if he were to be confirmed, then he would be sitting on the bench by the time the Supreme Court heard this case um, dealing with double jeopardy and this, the dual sovereignty clause. Well, I just threw up in my mouth a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Natasha, <laughs> thank you so much for doing the show. Everyone should read your stuff at The Atlantic. Everyone should follow you on Twitter because you are breaking big stories all the time. Um, and it's really important stuff. So thank you for walking us through it. Thanks so much, Tommy. Thanks for having me.